welcoming again our Facebook audience. We're broadcasting live on Facebook. Thank you so much for joining uh, this session. I want to go ahead and welcome all of you and in particular recognize the, the young people in the audience. I hope we'll get to find out how many of you have joined us who are under the age of 35. Um, I know there are many of you. Welcome to our leadership webinar series that is brought to you today by the Wangari Mathai Foundation, the Greenbelt Movement International. As I said earlier, special day indeed, nine years today since Wangari Mathai, whom I called my mother, left us. It has been and it has become for me a day of reflection, but also a day to reflect on action. And in fact, just before we joined us, one of our panelists, Vanessa, mentioned that she had just come from a day of action, and she, I'm sure she'll share that with us today. And I often tell people that should she walk into the room today, I would want her to be proud that we're shifting the needle on issues that matter. Uh, my name is Wanjira Mathai, and I'm proud to be the chair of the Wangari Mathai Foundation, also the Vice President and Regional Director for Africa at the World Resources Institute. Many of you know the great work that the Wangari Mathai Foundation is doing, a nonprofit dedicated to inspiring courageous and responsible leadership in young people and children in Kenya. It is inspired by the legacy of Wangari Mathai and focuses on this idea of the power of one, that each of us can be a potent agent of change in our communities. Also focusing on this idea of character, character traits like integrity and purpose and personal leadership and nurturing those in children and young people. We know that social emotional learning the softer skills are central to nurturing leadership. And that's why the foundation's work is anchored in emotional intelligence, where we partner with schools across Kenya, incorporating lessons on experiential learning, working with youth and young people to build this sense of, I can do it. And I don't have to wait for anybody else to do it for me. Hopefully this work will continue to find relevance outside these borders. And I know that in this audience today is represented so many from uh, so many other places beyond Kenya. This series is a part of a series we're starting on leadership, uh, commemorating this year when Wangari Mathai would have turned 80. So this is her 80th birthday year. And so we've started a campaign, Wangari at 80. And the fact that uh, so much that she achieved, we continue to benefit from. We wanted this year to honor her achievements and the legacy of her life and work through the Wangari at 80 initiative. You've probably already seen some of the activity around Wangari at 80, but it is worth noting that this campaign is highlighting projects from across the board, artists who've written songs, activists who are inspired by her, uh, and people who are just doing and planning so much in her, in her spirit, writing books, writing poetry, naming libraries and being inspired in all ways by her legacy. Please, if you have a chance, take a look at wangarimathai.org and look at the section on the enduring legacy and you will see just how much her life touched people around the world. So I hope we can begin this by reflecting on the reality of youth leadership. The truth of the matter is, at least for the African continent, we are the youngest continent in the world. I completely uh, did not realize that the average age until recently of Africans today is 19 years old. The youngest continent in the world. And in Kenya, we know that 70% of our population is actually under the age of 35. So we cannot talk about transformation of any sector today if we do not meaningfully engage young people. So today we have a terrific lineup of young women. Men will come next, so don't get anxious. We want to get a glimpse into what motivates them to do what they do. We're particularly interested in hearing where their spark came from. We know from reading about Wangai Mathai that these sparks are nurtured very early in life and role models play a critical role in who they become ultimately. And we want to hear what were the sparks 
that brought Vanessa and Liz to us. We also want to hear whether they feel a sense of purpose in their current work and how they know they have it. And I'm also keen to hear from them what we are not doing that is holding young people back. They have amazing ideas. They've expressed them. You'll hear some of them today. But what would they say to us, to you, the current leaders, that is holding them back? So I'll go ahead and introduce them to you. I'll start with Vanessa, Vanessa Nakate, who's the founder of Rise Up Climate Movement. She's a climate activist from Uganda. Many of you will know her face and was the first Fridays for Future climate activist in Uganda, starting the Rise Up Movement to amplify the voices of activists from the African continent. She's also led the Save the Congo Rainforest, which is one of the greatest uh, assets of this continent, the greatest lung of this continent. Welcome, Vanessa. Delighted to have you. I also want to introduce Salina Abraham. She's a senior officer at the Global Landscapes Forum. Salina is a Eritrean American. I love her story. True global citizen, raised in the Netherlands and lives in the United States. And as senior officer at GLF, she ensures that landscape challenges are addressed through all of GLF's flagship initiatives. Strong advocate for youth leadership, I was inspired greatly by her keynote at GLF and working in several areas with youth organizations, the World Bank, coordinating youth initiatives across the board. She's passionate about all things green. Welcome, Selena. delighted to have you. Next, we have Elizabeth Watuti, who is the head of campaigns and Daima coordinator at the Wangari Mathai Foundation. We're proud to have Liz as one of our talented leaders. She's well known as an environmentalist as well, like the other two, and a climate activist. She's also very proud for many of us, the recipient of the Wangari Mathai Scholarship Award, a, a partnership between the Rockefeller Foundation and KCDF here in Kenya. She founded the Green Generation Initiative, which nurtures young people to love nature and be conscious about the environment. She's a member of the Green Belt Movement, a board member of the Elephant Neighbor Center. And Elizabeth is also one of UN's Young Champions of the Earth and a Commonwealth Youth Award finalist. Welcome, Elizabeth. Welcome, Vanessa. Welcome, Selena. Delighted that you're all here. Let me add that if you have any questions, and this is to all of you panelists, as we have this conversation, please put them in the chat and the WMF team will organize them so that we can incorporate them into the discussion that we'll be having. I want to waste no more time and go straight into it. And I wanna ask the first question actually to all of you. I want all of you to, to share with us what motivates you to do what you do. And if you can mention as you share a little bit who people, role models along the way who inspired you to keep doing what you do. I will start with you, Vanessa. Thank you so much. Um, wow, what really motivates me to do what I do? I remember my starting of activism was in 2018. Um, that I was still in school and in that period, I wanted to do something that could cause change in the lives of the people in my community, uh, simply because I'd grown up seeing my father take part in activities uh, where they would help people with food or with access to water or with health facilities. So I wanted to do the same thing. So I started to carry out research to get to understand the problems that the people faced and to see where my voice would really work. And I was really surprised to find that climate change was one of those problems because in school, it isn't taught us something that is happening right now. It is taught us something that happened in the past or something that is coming in the far future that we do not have to worry about. So I, I was really pushed to read more about it and when I realized that some of these impacts were already visible in my country from the floods to the droughts to the landslides, that is when I decided to become a voice in the climate movement. And 
along the way, some of the people that that really uh, motivated me to keep striking, to to keep demanding for action. Um, there are quite a number of activists, and I think I wouldn't have enough time to list them. I think the the very first activist I I got to know in Africa was Elizabeth, and she was very very inspiring. And um, the very very first climate activist I got to know was Greta from Sweden because I really didn't know much about environmental work. I didn't know much about activism. So just to pick from, you know, generally in Africa, the very first person I got to know who was doing environmental work was Elizabeth and um, from Europe, it was Greta. And their work was an inspiration to me to also start striking. I remember meeting Elizabeth for the first time, must have been in Nigeria, and I learned so much from her. So those are the people that really, really inspired me and motivated me to keep speaking up and to keep demanding for action. Vanessa, and what a fine job you're doing. Thank you. Uh, Liz, we'll go to you. Thank you so much, Wanjera. Thank you to all my fellow panelists, Salina, Vanessa, so inspiring. So three things shaped me into the person that I am today. And one of them is my surrounding and the natural world growing up. And of course, the people who really inspired me and the people I would say I looked up to when I was growing up in terms of just getting involved in conservation. And the other thing is the challenges that I got to connect with or rather the challenges that I got to identify with when I was a child. And when I talk about the natural world, I grew up Greening was in the most forested region in Kenya, which means that I got to connect with the trees ahead of me, the bushes beside me, the clean streams and rivers flowing close to my homestead. Give me this strong love and connection to nature. And along the way, I began to also feel the pain of nature. Just anything that I would see um, as a challenge with nature is what really made me sad at this point in time. I remember seeing people seeing people cutting down trees anywhere these are the kind of things that really would make me so sad and along the way these challenges I think were a turning point for me because I wanted to learn more I wanted to read more about uh, environmental challenges I wanted to watch more of the documentaries and when I started to see how fast the wild forests were being destroyed and seeing how our waterways were becoming what I like to call a soup of poison. These things really broke my heart. And at some point, I know it was very overwhelming. And I not only got the, I also got something that I say the hunger to want to do something about these challenges. And I think along, I do a lot of these things. And I was greatly inspired by Prof. And I remember when I was a child, I really wanted to meet her and plant a tree with her. And this is something I always say that it's a dream that did not come true, but it didn't stop me from staying up to do the things that I'm doing today because I embarked on reading her books, my favorite being Unbowed, which you should all read if you've never read it, because it's really inspiring. And I think it made me become more and more motivated and want to do a lot of things. And just also the fact that the people that were surrounding me, my mom, my grandmom, these are people who knew Prof. Um, they knew her and so they would talk about her every other day and because I wanted to meet her their motivation was that if you want to meet prof you have to study her just like she did and you all know she was the first woman in eastern in east africa to earn a doctorate so these are the things that really shaped me and I think gave me the courage to continue stepping up to take action and be a change maker in terms of Great, conservation. Great, Elizabeth. So inspiring to hear you talk about your story because we all know you come from the same community area, almost a stone's throw from where Wangari Mathai was born. And it, it seems like you may have been drinking some of the same water. So good to see that passion. Um, Salina, love to see you and hear you. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, it's so nice to hear these stories. Uh, I think we all find 
very similar pathways to, to our passion. Um, but for me, like Vanessa, it started with my, my parents um, and just seeing, so being from Eritrea, they, um, you know, both the whole country came together for liberation um, and seeing how they just the power of community, the power of social movements, uh, the power of, you know, sacrificing um, your individual like needs in a, in a particular moment for the greater collective good um, and seeing how you can build a vision for a country that that just seeing that inspired me a lot. And then as we're talking about climate change, you're seeing the risk of everything you fought for. Um, and that made me realize that my parents had, they were the generation to fight, yes, for our country. And then my generation has to fight for, you know, the beauty of that vision, the, our lives, our future, what is that gonna look like? That's my responsibility. Um, so that's, that I think gave me the pillar of, community and, and activism and the power of not say individual leadership, but working in, uh, in tandem with others. Um, and then the other part, the other piece, I guess, of my life, I grew up with music. Um, so I loved music. Music brought my family together. My sisters and I were always singing. Um, and this is where I first had to learn to put myself out there for a love that I have. And so there's nothing more terrifying than standing in front of a crowd or like speaking in front of people and when you're putting your art or your heart out there for people to experience, you realize that it's not about you, but you have to share this passion with the world. And so as it came to activism, I realized that our passions are meant to be shared and spread. Uh, and sometimes that means I have to do the thing that scares me um, and walk forward anyway. So that's how I've, I've come to where I am now, I guess. Salina, thank you so much. You know, what's, what's common about all three of you, which is remarkable, is the amount of courage it must have taken for you to decide at such a young age that you will go out and strike and that you will go out and do the things you do that is that is stand in front of people and say what you're thinking. And so often we let you down. So we, I, I have always spoken about the fact that youth leadership is critical, but what am I doing to create that space? What can we do? What are we not doing? I'd love for each of you to speak to what is holding you back in the work that you do that would make you do even more? Are we giving you the space you need? Um, Vanessa. Well, um, speaking from how activism has been on my end, it is very hard to deliver the climate message in a massive way in a country like mine, probably it cuts across different countries in Africa. So the freedom of expression is not so open. So this is limiting different voices from coming up and speaking because they're scared that they could be arrested. We want activism to be be embraced in the African continent because this is our future that we are talking about. We want to have that freedom of expression. We want to be able to get permits to strike because it is very hard to get those permits. And also education needs to be embraced because if we have few people speaking about these issues, it is because the rest of the people are not aware about what is happening. We need to reach out to those communities and create as much awareness as possible. Because if someone knows that they are in a burning house, they will do everything they can to run out of that house. So what you can do for us is get us that freedom of expression if it is possible. And also create awareness and educate as many people as possible about what is happening. And to continue to do what you have done today, like giving this platform to different voices, because this is a way of telling their stories. This you are already doing, just keep doing it. Thank you, Vanessa. Such a strong point. Platforms for expression. And that is something a lot of us who are on this call 
have control of huge platforms and we need to bring more young people into those platforms prominently so that was very clear uh vanessa thank you so much liz platforms if we give them to you will that do it what else do you need yeah thank you so much wanjira so once the platforms are fair i think the next thing we need to think about is how the young people are getting involved at all levels and I'll just give a practical example of things that we see happening in the world today, whereby the young people are only involved maybe towards the end. You know, like, for example, we know there are so many things that are happening right now in terms of the environment, and we need to make all these uh, policies, we need to make things work out. But we also need to have the voices of the young people from the inception of everything that we're talking about, and not just having them maybe, you know, in the events, we need to have them, you know, making decisions because right now, for example, in this event, I know there's a lot of things that are going to come up as a result of this. We are going to be uh, developing a lot of things in terms of this webinar series. So once we have these voices at all levels, then I think it's something that is going to really help the young people. And then the second thing is that there's a lot of uh, individual responsibility going on in what young people are doing. And these things keep them motivated. But when, when we see in terms of the systems, things are different, then their efforts kind of uh, begin to become like they're getting down to the drain. So how can we keep them motivated? How can we keep their hopes high in terms of what they're doing? We need to see everyone getting involved. So we need to see everyone supporting young people's individual responsibility. We need to see everyone supporting their collective action as well. And we also want to see everyone, governments and organizations doing their fair share to address all these challenges so that what we are doing is not going to go down to the drain. So if every one of us is at the same table at all levels, then I think we'll be good to go. Thank you, Liz. Solidarity is something that I learned so much from my mother. I think when Wangari Mathai succeeded, it was because of the solidarity that she received from so many. And when young people put themselves in the fore, we should show up, support them and back them up. That is really very clear. Selena, I watched your, uh, your keynote uh, remarks beautifully delivered at GLF. And during that, you presented a very clear list of ideas that had been curated in one short afternoon. It seemed like a few young people got together. And one of those was about bringing, you know, exchange visits for small scale farmers and really clear, clearly curated ideas. But you also said that for those ideas to take flight, they need to be supported. What would you say? I mean, you came up with good ideas. What next? Yeah, uh, I think this is the, the part that is maybe the hardest and the most frustrating is young people. We have the solutions, we have ideas, we have the capability. Um, and where, what we lack is, a, is, is trust from those in, in power and those who are able to make decisions. There's, we need to have true youth leadership. Um, and to have those positions of, of authority or power, there needs to be trust. Uh, and there needs to be an ability to say, we're going to create some room here. Um, and the, I think that the challenge that young people have when we're building ideas, projects, um, you know, starting your own organization, your own business, you have a lack of credibility and recognition amongst the system. There isn't someone there who's backing you. You're not part of you know, some UN initiative or some organization here that's built 50 years of experience. And, and we need to fix that gap. And I think there's a huge power in, in maybe mentorship in, in organizations like the foundation to, to come in um, and start giving some real credibility to, to these new and upcoming uh, initiatives. We need to find a way to, to support them, even if it's just a space uh, on the website, that's that's something that really enables young people to say, okay, here, we're moving, this is what I'm doing, um, I'm recognized. So I think that's that's very important. Thank you, Selena. Really, really important point there. Trust. I mean, for many of us, no trust is the chief driver of just about anything we want to do. You lose trust and negotiations fall apart on the basis of trust alone. Thank you so much. Those three really important points. I just wanted to cycle back to each of you and maybe start with you, Vanessa, and just ask, as, you in, as you're involved in your activism today, if you are in front of one of the leaders and they gave you the platform, what would you want to say to them, given the work that you're doing now? 
Well, um, the leaders must face the climate emergency. It is time for them to mess the, it's time for them to stop messing up our future and messing up our planet. Enough with the people dying, enough with the animals dying, enough with the ecosystems being destroyed. Now is the time to protect our life support systems, to protect the lives of the people, and to make sure that the planet is healthy and livable for everyone. We do not have any more time left. Time was lost the moment people started dying. So leaders must act like the adults they are and take the action that we need. It is time for them to face the climate emergency, to face the truth of the science, and to fight every injustice. Vanessa, thank you very much. Very clear. And I think that the purpose and the passion in, in the work that you do makes that message um, ring really strong. Liz, you started Green Generation Initiative. You're the founder of that organization and working with children. What do you tell young children who are looking up to you as a, their role model and you know how important it is that they get inspired from a very young age? Thank you so much, Wanjira. So when I am communicating with children, I know the thing that we are trying to do here is to secure a safe future and a livable world for them and for us all. And so my message to them is that as much as they may seem to be small or you know, they're children, we have to all stand up and stand up for what is right and stand up and fight for our future because I like to assume that no one is really fighting for us. So I put them in such a scenario whereby you need to assume that no one is fighting for us and assume that this is our planet, this is our future, and this is the kind of a world that we envision as children. So if we do not step up right now and stand up for what we believe is right, and for us what we believe is right is to live in a world where we do not have to bear the consequences of the actions of previous generations, then that's my message to the children. And I think uh, the best way that I do this is to make sure that they also get connected to the natural world because I know we are living in a planet where a lot of people have been greatly disconnected from the natural world. And I think that is what is causing the many challenges that we are having today. And this is risking the future of all the children. And so the best thing right now and the best thing we can all continue to do to all the children out there is to get them connected to the natural world because they are not the future leaders. They are the leaders of today. And unless we begin to see them as the leaders of today, then I think we will not be you know, taking like urgent action to address some of the challenges that are risking their future. So for me, uh, that is, has been always my message to the children. And I really want them to also step up and believe that they can also be the change because they are the change and this planet belongs to them. Great, Liz. Thank you so much. Salina, I have been struck by the fact that GLF so often and many other organizations like that bring young people to the conferences and give them a platform to speak. But when you talk to those young people, they're struggling. They're struggling to pay the bills. They're struggling to fund the work that they do. What can we do to make sure that we make meaningful our support of young people, that it's not lip service, that we find ways to advocate in the right places. So this work actually happens on the ground. Yeah, that, that is the, the question of the century. This is what we have to figure out. Um, and I think there's a huge responsibility for those of us working in organizations that are able to, to operate and are able to mobilize funds. Um, and so our philosophy has always been that youth will drive the youth strategy, youth drive the youth activities, they tell us what to do. We fund, support, and coordinate in service of the youth community. And so um, I'm really grateful, really thankful that for that, because I was on the side of being the young person saying, we need to do this and this and that, and to have an organization listen, um, and to have an organization say, yes, we'll fund you, we'll come, you'll strategize with us. Um, we're not afraid to have conversations with you about politics, about funds. We're going to create budgets together. We're going to build capacity together. 
um, that is really important. And it takes, um, it, it takes a level of risk. And that is what I find so frustrating from leaders is that if you're constantly trying to minimize your risk, you're limiting your dreams over and over again. They become smaller, your vision for what's possible becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and so for me, it's imperative that we have leaders who are willing to take risk. Um, and then you bring incredible young people who have the experience of navigating and who can balance both. It's not easy, um, but it's a path I think we have to take. And um, it, it's, we cannot continue to work in separate, in our silos of, of young people continuing to strike on the streets and then people walking in and having negotiations in other rooms. Like that is not the way we're going to, to build the world we want in the future. Um, so that's, that's my philosophy. I think it, it needs to be youth led and I think organizations need to step back and start to serve. Selena, great. I think that that to me is, is a really important point is the trust and certainly the, the opportunities, the resourcing of those initiatives. Vanessa, in the work that you do, how are you, how are you finding the reception with the philanthropic community? Do you find the support you need? Are you, um, is the enthusiasm matched? And I, I like what Selena said about risk and dreams. That's interesting that the risk is often inversely <laughs> related to the dreams and young people are dreamers and so are you finding your dreams matched by the support you need financially well um that is something that it is kind that is kind of hard to talk about because um i have worked with quite many organizations um maybe with having uh, panels uh, webinars things like that but honestly from my own personal experience the only support that I have got has been bringing my voice to the platform so there has never been any form of financial support um, maybe towards some of the projects that I do or maybe any other activist so I feel like it only ends um, on the platform and them asking you about what you are doing. And when you tell them, it only ends there. So I feel there is still a gap in that because if we want to see the youth driving change in their communities, then we should give them more than the platform. When you ask about their work, go ahead and support their work in a way. Because if you just stop there, then you've left, um, your support is lacking, I should say, your support is lacking. So that is something that has to really be looked into. And I'm certain, I'm sure that I'm not the only activist who has seen this. So at some point it makes you feel like they are doing this for themselves. They are inviting you for themselves, for their own benefit. So we need to have more of uh, not just the, um, how would I call it, the emotional kind of support. We also need uh, more physical support because that is what will drive the transformation through the projects that the young people are doing. Thank you, Vanessa. In the early days of the Greenbelt movement, I remember Wangari Mathai saying that it was those small gifts that came from friends, some of whom are related to organizations who are with us on this uh, webinar today. And that made the difference. Those were the sparks. Liz, how do we, and, and it is possible that young people are a risky investment in the in the classic terms but we have to invest in them we know that the demographics are saying that we will be toast if we don't do it when you have the youngest population in the world how are there good examples out there about how we can bridge that gap between the risk that people face at least the philanthropic community might look and say or even the the private sector and the, the, the reality that this support is needed and these are the people who will drive it. Yeah, thank you so much, Wanjira. And I think in the same question, the first thing we need to look around is who is telling our stories as young people. 
because as much as we're saying that the young people are really getting involved in a lot of activities and projects out there, the big question still remains on who is telling these stories. And I know we tend to highlight a few and then others we do not like mention them. So the first thing we need to do even before we focus on how to even support is to highlight these activities and to amplify these activities that the young people are getting involved in. And I know this goes back down to what is happening at the grassroots levels. So we don't get to hear these people and the same way they don't get to get any support because we have not highlighted them. So I think the basis of all this gets back down to how we are able to identify them because I know if this, this, the, the will to support is there, then we will definitely look for these people and we'll highlight to the world what they're doing. And the next thing we'll do is that we will empower them and do much on capacity building. And I think some of the examples and things you have been able to see right now, like Vanessa has mentioned, I know it has been more of the visibility, it's been more of giving the platforms to the young people to be able to share their ideas. But sometimes once they share their platforms, it ends at that. So I think uh, the huge gap uh, that's here, it all goes back down to how different stakeholders get to engage. Because I know different organizations focus on different things. So there are those that would do on the visibility and there are those that would finance these projects and there are those that would focus on how they can link some of these young people to other young people that are doing similar objective, similar activities, but are all focused on the same objectives. So I think for me, the highlight here would be how different organizations would be able to connect to make sure that we are all making sure that the young people are getting involved at all levels. And by all levels, it's not just the platform, it's beyond the platform. And also making sure that the impact that they're trying to achieve is actually ending up making a huge difference in the world. Because at the end of the day, we all want to change the world. The young people are being the change makers. So how can we ensure that their input is actually adding up to what we are talking about, having a different world, having a kind of a world that is safe and secure for us all. So we have to make sure that every organization maybe identifies what their strength is, how can they support the young people and how can all these efforts now be amplified to make sure that we complete the circle to make sure that young people are involved at all levels. Thank you ladies, that was really important and perhaps for us a message that we need to, maybe in the next series uh, for this leadership webinar, begin to build those bridges and put on the table some of the real opportunities that exist for young people like you, leaders like you, to be able to do what you do more meaningfully and, and, and well supported. I think that's an important message to all of us on this. I want to welcome all those who have joined us since we started and also remind you to answer the poll that is out there and also send us your questions. We're going to turn to some of the audience questions now and I'm going to um, ask a few of them, but then keep them coming. Um, I wanted to give a chance to, to Vanessa and, and Selena uh, to also answer perhaps the question uh, about if there are opportunities for that bridge making and we could take that as you answer um, the questions going forward. There's a question from Alfred in Brazil. How can the legacy of Professor Mathai help the leaders overcome poverty and inequality in Africa. Um, I think I'll give that to you, Liz. You've been inspired by her. What elements of her work, her life, do you think would help in addressing uh, poverty and inequality? Thank you, Wanjira. Two things I would highlight in this case, and I think one of them is we all know that Prof uh, stood up strong for what she believed in, and she did not believe in anything holding her back. And so when it comes to us, uh, you know, ending poverty as a nation, as a continent, as countries, then I think the first thing we need to do is to stand up for, uh, for what is right and stand up and make sure that we are changing some of the systems that have been holding us back in terms of uh, poverty. And I think the next thing that we need to do as a whole is to believe in the aspect of teamwork that uh, the fact that a lot of people are trying a lot of things to make sure that they end poverty. But when we bring all these actions, when we bring all these initiatives, and when we bring all these ideas together and work together as a team in terms of uh, ending poverty, then I think we can be able to address this challenge. So I think the greatest aspects we can 
uh, build up on when it comes to profs work and life is the aspect of teamwork and to make sure that we are also not just waiting for things to happen, but we're also standing up and taking action and being on the forefront to actually end poverty because I know each and every person can be able to address these challenges. And we don't have to always wait for maybe the people in power. Sometimes we get angry because they are not acting up. But even as we get angry, we can step up also and step up and make sure that we're also doing something from our end. Because we have seen people from uh, different parts of the continent, for example, in Africa, they are trying the best that they can to even end poverty in their in their, in, their, in their counties, for example, to end poverty in their small regions. So how can all these efforts now uh, help amplify the bigger picture in ending poverty? Because we say that those small acts when multiplied by millions of people are what is going to eventually make a difference. And that's exactly what Prof did, being a hummingbird and then making sure that we are raising more hummingbirds as well. And at the end of the day, all these small aspects are going to end up uh, helping us uh, end poverty, for example. Great, great uh, example there, Liz. I, I completely agree with you. And I think that one of the things I always remember that inspired the setting up of the foundation in the first place is that idea of the power of one, that each of us, if we look around, we can solve a problem in our community. And one of the things that the education system in, around the world is trying to change is that we must be the solvers of the problems we face. So if you look around in your own community, one of the things that Wangai Mathai taught the women of the Green Belt Movement is that you can be the solvers. You can be, you have the answers to the question of food insecurity. Plant your own food. You can green your landscapes. Plant your own um, trees. And I remember people asking, where are this? Where shall we get seeds? She said, look up at the trees. You'll see seeds. Collect those seeds. And it was just those simple things. The power of one that each of us can be such a potent example. There's a question from Mark about how people outside Africa can support people across the continent. Vanessa, what can people outside the continent do to support um, entrepreneurs like you three here on the continent? Well, um, the first thing I would talk about is amplifying these voices. Because I have seen young people in Africa struggle to have their voices heard, struggle to tell their stories uh, on the international stage. So I believe that the people outside Africa can help by providing these international stages, international platforms for the young people in Africa. We all know that Africa as a continent is among the lowest emitters of CO2 emissions. That is why African voices are needed on the international stage to hold the international community for the highest levels of CO2 emissions in the atmosphere. So we need these voices on international platforms. We need them in media coverage because there is still um, underrepresentation of voices of young Africans who are fighting for the climate. And also supporting the work that they are doing because many of them have various projects in Uganda, in Kenya, in Nigeria. Look out for these young people and support the work that they are doing. Because like um, what my fellow panelists has already said, it is those, those small acts that will help us transform this world. So support their work, amplify their voices. And it shouldn't just stop at inviting them to these tables of discussion. Even the weight of their discussion should be heavy enough because it's one thing to invite us to those stages. And yet what we are going to say isn't welcomed in the way that it should be. So the more the platforms, the higher the weight of our discussions. Really well said, Vanessa. Amplify their voices, uh, support their work. Uh, uh, very clear and I agree completely. The media 
international platforms, uh, genuine representation on those platforms. Selena, I wanted to ask you to reflect on the same question. What else could the international community do to support entrepreneurs like yourselves? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think Vanessa touched on one of the most important pieces. The representation is, um, it's shockingly bad. You know, we think about the, where we are, we're in 2020 and still we're, we're not seeing the representation that, um, you know, the continent deserves. Um, we're not seeing the diversity of representation. There's so many incredible voices um, to uplift. Um, and I think that's a good place to start. Um, but I also think what we're not seeing is, is the stories of, um, of hope that young people have to offer um, and the, the solutions, the things that they're doing on the ground, the stuff that we're all seeing on our Twitter feeds because we're plugged into our community, but that the world is not seeing. Um, and, and that is, is something that I think is really important. So I think if, just the act of sharing, of inquiring, of messaging, of covering these stories um, that are right now just sitting in a Twitter feed is really important in giving legitimacy um, to the young people who are doing their work. Um, in addition, I think there are some, some very simple ways to get involved. The, the funding um, piece that we were talking about earlier, that is a very complicated endeavor. F financing is, is complicated, whether you're looking for grants, whether you're looking for private investment. Um, and so I see this in, in two ways, two things that we must do. One is we need to train and build capacity for young people who have the energy, the willingness to actually pursue that, uh, whether that's their entrepreneur, uh, they're an entrepreneur, they need private investment just to understand what it means, um, what they, how their project needs to be set up, what it needs to look like. Um, and then second, which I think is, more tangible for those of us working in organizations. In my opinion, every budget in an organization should have a substantial percentage to youth-led activities. And youth-led activities, there should be a diversity of that. There should be some that are direct payments to young people doing action on the ground, some that are financing these learning, capacity building activities, of building community, of maintaining sustainability, longevity of that. Um, so I, I think I think it's purely unacceptable for any organization to be operating and to not have um, budget, substantial amount of their budget going to young people and especially if they're operating um, in Africa. Um, so that's one thing that I would encourage everyone to push for wherever you're working. Thank you, Selena. And I think you're also referring to incubators, accelerators that are, that are directed. And we really want to see if we can, as part of this series, highlight some of those, because I think also just making those connections, matchmaking might be exactly what is needed. There's a question from Kirk Ekstrom on Facebook, and he says that looking at the three of you really incredibly confident and uh, have seem to have everything going it might be a little intimidating for other young people trying to to do something and and is there a way for them to grow to become like you you all have international platforms and you're all um, well known but are there ways that people can look at you be inspired and take small steps towards um, what would you say to a young Vanessa, a young Liz, a young Selena who's looking at you and saying, I want to be them? We'll start with you, Liz, and we'll, we'll go around. And actually, unfortunately, we are actually running out of time. So I want this reflection to be your, your final reflection. I promise we'll start, uh, we'll do this again and keep hearing, but I want you to reflect on that question. What would you tell your younger self who's looking at you and feeling intimidated? Thank you so much, Wanjera. That's a great question. So I would say, as you have heard from all the stories from the young panelists here, everyone started from somewhere. Everyone was inspired by something and everyone was caused to take action because of something that happened in their life or education. And of course, developing this courage needs for us to understand what it, it is that caused us to do the things that we are doing today. 
And so for me, I would say it all begins with being able to identify something that you're connecting to and being able to identify with the challenge surrounding you and then making sure that not, nothing is holding you back from stepping up to take that action. Because like for me, what I would say, the anger from seeing the different things that are happening to the environment also led to that hunger to want to do something about it. And of course, what happens is that a lot of people out there, a lot of young people really want to do so much for the environment. They want to do so much for the society. They want to do so much to change the system that we have right now. And I think one of the things that tend to hold us back is feeling as if we are too inferior it's feeling as if we are too small it's feeling as if we don't have too much or we don't have what it takes to make a difference but my message is that every one of us has whatever it takes to be a change maker every one of us has got whatever it takes to stamp out there and take action we just have to remember the story of the hummingbird that prof always said so we cannot just sit back and watch our planet get down to the train but we can stand up and choose to do something that will end up making a difference however small it is it's eventually going to help us make a difference so which whichever thing that you're trying to do always ask yourself am i doing the best that i can to make a difference in the society am i doing the best that i can to change the world or am i just watching as the planet get down to the drain so just always remember to be like that hummingbird and for me that story inspires me every now and then to keep moving and i hope it inspires you as well to keep moving be a hummingbird, uh, absolutely. Uh, you've got what it takes. That's what Liz leaves you with. Vanessa, what are your parting words? What do you say to a young Vanessa? Really, um, starting from uh, the words that Greta said, no one is too small to make a difference. So regardless of who you are, where you come from, which school you go to, which country, you, you come from, we need you because your voice is important. You may not even be a climate activist because there are quite a number of challenges that people face on a day-to-day -day life. But what is that light within you? What does he want to talk about? What does he want to speak about? What change does your inner self want to drive? Because I believe that it starts from within you and your surrounding to decide on what you actually want to do and the change that you want to give the world. So you have to believe in yourself. And you don't have to worry about starting alone. For example, if you want to be a climate activist, there are different voices across the world. There are different movements across the world. From Fridays for Future, Rise Up, um, and any other, any other movements, um, you can join them because most of them can be reached through social media so that you do not feel like you are starting on your own. So there is room to start with someone else. But always remember that we need you. Your voice is needed in making this world a better place. If we are united, if we work together, and if we demand for the justice that we need, I believe that we will be able to transform this world and make it a better place. So just endeavor to be part of the change, to be part of the transformation. Thank you. Vanessa, thank you so much. No one is too small. Believe in yourself. What strong words. Selena, you have the last word. Yeah, I want to echo what Elizabeth and Vanessa said, because every time I look back, like the biggest barrier to my dreams has too often been myself. Uh, and this is something I have to do every day. And if I don't, I know what my day is going to look like to just wake up and give myself the encouragement I need. If, I, if I'm not speaking it out into existence that I'm capable, that um, you know, I, my, I'm worthy of everything that I'm accomplishing, that I deserve to be where I am today, your mind sometimes can be the one that stops you. And so I think it's, it can look intimidating, you know, as having um, what we have, but we all started from somewhere and it's been the joy to, of my like, life to watch Elizabeth and to see her impact grow, to watch Vanessa, to watch so many young people step into their own 
power um, and to find your voice and to not be afraid to tell your story, to be vulnerable, to be honest. Um, the, when you're living in full alignment with yourself, you'll, you'll know it. Um, so I would just say, be honest to who you are um, and then honor yourself every day by speaking life into your dreams, into yourself. Um, don't live in your comfort zone. I, I know when I'm living in it, then I'm, I'm staying in the same place for too long. So, so push yourself and then also find your tribe, find your people who will encourage that and do that for you. It's uh, not a journey you can do alone always. Thank you, Salina. Solidarity, again, a clear message. I, it has been a total delight for me to moderate this panel. What an amazing panel we've had today. Liz, Vanessa, Salina, thank you so much for sharing so much and for opening your hearts to us. We have heard you. Believe in yourself, you told us. We believe in you. Wangari Mathai Foundation, the Green Belt Movement International, we are right there for you. And we will continue this conversation, continue the discussion as we open up and unpack what we believe are really, really important questions to be answered. Plus, platforms of expression, you told us about solidarity, you talked about trust, and you talked about amplifying voices and sharing platforms accelerators, incubators, de-risking this population because regardless of the sector, agriculture, I work across agriculture, forestry, water, energy, every sector needs your energy in it, but we need to be meaningful in our involvement of you. Thank you so much. And friends, all of you joining us from around the world, it has been our pleasure. Send us your eyes. Thank you for joining us. Let us know how we can activate the financial pillar for these entrepreneurs. I know you have ideas. Our lines are open. Our director, Nicola Hanke, is on this line, and I know she will be looking for your ideas to arrive. Let's keep this conversation going on on Twitter, Wangari Mathai, at Wangari Mathai, and Facebook. And our Facebook audience, thanks so much for joining us, too. If you've been in today, as I have, and want to learn more about our work, please go to wangarimathai.org and greenbeltmovement.org and you can find ways to support this incredible work. Thank you so much for your generosity.